Thank you. It's quite an honor to be here amongst you in the Savannah. It's one of our favorite towns in Georgia, or probably the best town because Bullard is the best and it's not quite a township. But uh, it was a fateful day in 1969 when Chuck LaBelle decided to move to Macon, Georgia, because when he opened the door at Capricorn Records, there I stood. <laughs> and uh, we've had a long, <laughs> lovely friendship and love affair. And also, I introduced him to trees and the environment, and we've had hand in hand tried to make a difference in the world. So, uh, he's become an author and written several books on the uh, issues of forest land. And so, I'd like to introduce to you Chuck Lavelle, and he can tell you his story about growing a better America. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everybody. How we doing? Great. So great to see you. Wonderful to be here. Um, I hope you'll forgive me if I'm a little bit tired uh, this afternoon because I spent the evening with Keith Richards up in New York. So <laughs> it's amazing that I even made it down here today, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, no, I say that because I want to share with you that I was uh, very pleased to get Keith on my next record, which is a, uh, a tribute to pioneering blues piano players. And not only did I have the pleasure of getting Keith, but uh, my friend John Mayer. I've been working with John on his uh, next record, so he was kind enough to also jump in and help me out on my project. Uh, but it did make for kind of a long night. <laughs> uh, and I'm just glad I was able to be here today. But we're here to talk about books. And as Rose Lane said, truly an honor and a pleasure to be here in Savannah, uh, one of our favorite cities in the whole wide world. And we've been just about everywhere in the world. There's been a few places we haven't gotten to yet, but Savannah is truly uh, very special to us. And, uh, you know, we kind of have a dream that maybe one of these days we can have a place here. We just love coming here so much. And I certainly want to thank all the folks from the uh, Savannah Book Festival for the hard work that they have done to put this festival on. I think it's wonderful, along with the music festival that starts, when is it, next month or April? Coming up soon. But uh, Savannah celebrates the arts, and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So what in the world is a rock and roll piano player doing talking about growing a better America, talking about environmental issues? Well, as I like to say, it's all Rose Lane's fault, you see. Uh, as she mentioned, we met in 69 when she was working at the record company, Capricorn Records, and I, I was a uh, you know, very young fellow coming over trying to find a career in music in Macon, Georgia and was fortunate to get hooked up in Capricorn Records and very fortunate to get hooked up with Miss Rose Lane. It took me a couple of years to get up the courage to ask her out for a date, but uh, much to my surprise, when I did, she accepted, and we were married in 73. And so uh, I guess that uh, means about 38 years of marriage this year. That's kind of kind of cool, huh? Thank you. We get a lot of comments about that, you know. People say, my goodness, 38 years, how in the world have you stayed together that long in the rock and roll business, entertainment business? And I, uh, you know, people ask, what, what's your secret? They ask us that. And I tell them, well, it's really very simple because marriage is like photographic film, it has to be developed in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, her family, Rose Lane's family, the Whites and the Falks, uh, the Denisons, uh, have been connected to the land for generations as farmers, as um, people who tend cattle and tend forest lands. And when I first came out, you know, I was dating the farmer's daughter, and so eventually I had to go meet the farmer and the family. Uh, and that was quite an experience for me. Of course, back then I was a long haired hippie boy, you know, trying to make my way in rock and roll, and I was scared to death to meet the farmer, I don't mind telling you. But they welcomed me into the family with open arms, and it was just an absolutely wonderful experience from the beginning, as it has been all these 38 years. Um, but it didn't take me long to realize the dedication to the land, the honor of the land, the, the passion for the land that, uh, that the family had. And it began to rub off on me a little bit. And then in 1981, Rosalind's grandmother passed away, leaving her a parcel of land in what they called the home place. And so it became our responsibility uh, to carry on this heritage of stewardship of the land. And this is where, when it really began for me, 
uh, my sincere interest in environmental issues and natural land issues. And, uh, you know, what we, we began to ponder what would we do with this land. Uh, it was a diverse farm at the time. They had row crops. They did have cattle. And they did have some timberland. But Rosie and I investigated all kinds of possibilities. We talked about peach trees or pecan trees, nursery stock, you know, or fruit orchards. I thought about all kinds of things. But as time went on and, and I learned more about forestry, trees and forests, and all the things that trees and forests do for us, I just became fascinated with it. I guess one of the real aha moments for me was realizing that that thing over there is made out of wood. Uh, the instrument that's giving, given me my living, uh, so many other musical instruments that come from the resource of wood. My friend Keith wouldn't have those guitars. My friend Charlie Watts wouldn't have those drums and uh, so on and so forth. So many musical instruments that make wonderful sounds come from that resource. But trees do so much more than make musical instruments, don't they? Just look around you here in this beautiful church and you see the resource of wood. Uh, trees also clean our air, they clean our water, they provide abundant home and shelter for all manner of wildlife. And so I began to, as I went forward, began to realize the importance of this resource. And that led me to write, writing my first book, Forever Green, The History and Hope of the American Forest, because as I studied and as I learned uh, and let it all soak in, and I would travel with the Rolling Stones or with other bands and meet people backstage and they'd say, oh, you're into trees. Well, geez, isn't it just terrible what they're doing to the trees? I said, well, who, who is they and what do you mean it's terrible? Well, they're just cutting them down. They're cutting the trees down. Well, yeah, uh, what kind of house do you live in? Uh, well, it's made out of wood. Uh, bet you have some nice wood furniture in that house. Yeah, we do. You have a piano? Well, it's not, you know. So I, I wanted to enlighten people that this is a, a natural and organic and most importantly, a renewable resource. Uh, and it is and can be sustainable if we do the right thing by our trees, forests, by our lands, by our, all of our natural resources. So this was the impetus for the, the first book, Forever Green. And then going on from there, uh, I did an autobiography called Between Rock and a Home Place. And uh, then from there, a children's book, uh, The Tree Farmer, because I realized in this uh, discussion and as, as time went on, how important it is to reach our children about these issues. You know, it's one thing to talk to adults about this, but the earlier we can reach our children and let them know the importance of these resources and how we can sustain them, uh, the better. So uh, <clears throat> that led, led me to this book, eventually, to Growing a Better America, because here's the impetus for the book. I would give speeches from time to time in which I would talk about something called the Invisible Forest Health Crisis. Uh, now, the good news is that we actually have as much forest land now as we had 100 years ago, which is remarkable, uh, especially given the, the population and, and the growth that we've experienced. A lot of that is due to conversion of agricultural lands to forest lands, uh, as we need less and less lands to grow our food as technology gets better and better. Um, then a lot of these lands have been con converted to forest. And of course, a lot of our lands have been preserved, national forest system, national park system. And uh, America, by the way, uh, most of our forests are owned by individuals. Some 10 million families across our country own most of, of America's forest lands. And those people want to be good stewards of the land. So the good news is we have uh, as much forest as we did uh, 100 years ago. Remarkable. The challenge is the loss of natural lands that we are experiencing to growth and development. Uh, we have 310 million people in this country now. We're going to have 400 million by 2040. It's a tremendous amount of pressure on our natural resources. Atlanta loses uh, somewhere between 50, uh, well, 80 and 100 acres a day to growth and development. You know, I, I cite in the book, and I remember as a kid growing up in Alabama, we had an aunt that lived in Atlanta. We would go visit her. And the year I was born, 1952, Atlanta first topped a million people in population. And many of you have seen that, that sign on Peachtree that depicts the population. I can remember being probably, you know, eight, nine years old and seeing that sign say something like a million four when we would go visit our aunt. Well, you know what that sign reads now? Five million seven hundred thousand. 
and it's ticking up all the time. It's just remarkable that, that Atlanta has seen that kind of growth. And we're seeing that kind of growth across our country. And again, this is just a lot of pressure on our natural resources. So I would give this speech when I would talk about the invisible forest health crisis. And I would say, well, listen, I'm not anti-growth. We're going to have the growth whether we like it or not. But is the growth that we're going to experience going to be rapid, rampant, and reckless? Or can it be smart, strong, and sustainable? And the more I said those words, the more I focused on the second half of that, smart, strong, and sustainable, and thinking, you know, can we do that? Yeah. Do we have the opportunity to really think about how we are going to grow from here on out? And if so, then what are some of the particulars that we need to be looking at uh, in, in shaping that growth? So my partner, Jeff Craig, and I, Jeff uh, was my co-writer in my autobiography, I called Jeff up and I said, I got this idea for a book. I'd like for you to help me. Jeff, by the way, uh, I like working with Jeff because his background is journalism. So he, he was a journalist in Edmonton, Canada when I first met him. He did an article on me. Turned out pretty nice. We met, became friends. Eventually, Jeff moved to uh, Southern California, to the Los Angeles area, and we stayed in communications. And then, as I mentioned earlier, he helped me with uh, my autobiography. Called up Jeff and I said, listen, I got this idea for a book. Are you interested? He said yes. So uh, Jeff came to Charlene Plantation and stayed with us. I had the outline for the book, talked to Jeff about the type of research that we needed to do and, and you know, the concepts, the ideas, the things I wanted to focus on. And uh, <clears throat> we began to move forward. Kind of bit off more than we could chew because I had no idea uh, this project was going to become this difficult. I thought, oh, we can probably knock this out in four months, six months, Roseland, what was it, a little bit, a better part of two years now that we uh, worked on this. It was somewhat of a moving target because as time goes on, these numbers change, the statistics change, and we would get a statistic and then, you know, a month from, from that point, it would change and be something else. So it was a challenge to kind of hone that in and decide at some point you have to accept that and say, well, this is a point in time, this is 2010, 2011, picture of America at this point in time. And we'll do the best we can with the numbers, and if they change, they change. Uh, also, websites, you know, the web is everything these days. Some of you, by the way, may know that I'm involved in a website called the Mother Nature Network, MNN.com. And uh, my partner, Joel Babbitt, and I started this two years ago. It's, uh, we're very happy to tell you that now we're the third most visited environmental website in the world. So we hope you guys will visit MNN and check in. So it's another extension of, of my interests in the environment. Uh, but we went to MNN for resources. We went to many, many other websites for resources. Boy, it's great to have the web these days, isn't it? My heavens, the information you can get is, is mind-boggling. But we also personally went out and visited uh, communities that were dealing with smart growth. Uh, we, we studied very hard on Interestingly enough, some cities that are declining, cities like Detroit, St. Louis, even Birmingham has kind of stagnated, but Detroit and St. Louis have really super declined. And so now, uh, part of the book, we talk about smart decline and how we can actually rip up asphalt and concrete and put uh, you know, nice grasses and parks and trees uh, on those spaces. Uh, it's important that we do that in the right way and do it very carefully. But of course, the real focus of the book is this issue of growth and how we're going to grow forward. Um, we went through the outline. We, our methodology, some people ask us, how do, you, how do you like to write? Well, I had the outline. Jeff and I kind of filled that in lightly during our first meeting. We did a tremendous amount of research, as I said. We read a lot of books on this subject. And um, then Jeff went back to California. And I'm an early riser when I'm not with Keith Richards. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the old plantation, I'm, I'm getting up usually about, you know, 5, 5.30, 6 in the morning. And a cup of coffee and sit behind that computer and start banging it out. So Jeff and I would back and forth with emails. You know, he would have some ideas and shoot me some research. I would tweak it up and then send it back to him. And that was the methodology of working with Jeff and the way that we did things together. And finally, we uh, began to close in on this and, and after almost two years and, and come to the end of it. And then the next process, we had uh, 
we had collected quite a lot of illustrations and pictures. We felt it was important to uh, illustrate what we could out of, out of some of this. Uh, and that, that actually required uh, going out as well and doing some photography as well as collecting and you know, contacting photographers and, and fi finding uh, public domain uh, pictures and illustrations and so forth. And that was quite a process as well. And then finally, you know, it comes time to put all of this together. Now, Rose Lane and I own our own publishing company uh, and record company for that matter. It's called Evergreen Arts, aptly named for our love of, uh, of natural things. And uh, we wanted to keep this in our family of Evergreen, so uh, we knew that we would own the publishing rights to this and it would be under our own company, but we certainly need a distributor. Uh, you know, we, we're a two-person team. Well, my friend Scoots Lemon is over here and Scoots is part of our team and we do have uh, folks that help us out that do a great job, but basically we have a very small organization and we need help in dis distributing the book. So. Uh, with Between Rock and a Home Place, I had part, we had partnered with uh, Mercer University Press, and they did a good job. You know, they're not uh, Little Brown or Penguin or as, as big as that, but they do manage to get the book into stores and do some promotion. Um, speaking of Mother Nature Network, we have a fellow in-house that does media for MNN, someone that I have worked with for many, many years, and so his name is Dan Beeson. And so I recruited Dan to help with the publicity for this. this of course, this, this is how the big picture works. You know, you got to uh, put the thing together and then hopefully go out and find ways to promote it. So uh, there you go. We have the partners of Mercy University Press, uh, uh, Jeff and I working together, our own company, Evergreen Arts, uh, this is that works very hard. And then, you know, through a network of people that I've known or give speeches to uh, through the years, uh, we do some direct sales to these people and they help to also give the book exposure. But now let me get into the meat of the book and what the book is all about. Uh, as I said, the, the, the real theme is smart growth. I've got to keep an eye on our time here. Uh, somebody said they wanted me to play piano a little bit. I know you guys have questions, so, <laughs> so I'm going to try to be... Uh, conscious of the, of the times. I, throw something at me, honey, if I go late. <laughs> Let me know it's time. Uh, we, we sent the manuscript to an editor to have it edited, and then after the editing an indexer, we decided we wanted an index uh, for the book, and so all of that came together. Finally, uh, we the cover art, by the way, I have to mention that. I'm really pleased with the way this turned out. A company called Burt and Burt out of Macon, Georgia. It's a husband and wife team, Jim and Mary Frances Burt. Just did a lovely job. I told Jim uh, the title of the book, and he said, well, what's your vision of it? And I said, for the cover, you know, for art. And I said, well, I've always loved that phrase that Ronald Reagan used to give, that America is a shining city on a hill. And so with that, you know, Jim very cleverly came up with using the flag and putting the shining city on a hill, but when you look closely, you can't see it from where you are. But you'll see that there's windmills, you'll see that there's solar panels, and that, uh, you know, that we're talking about kind of a new America, America that's reinventing itself and reorganizing itself to be leaner and greener. And so, so here we are. I thought to begin the book, the first thing we should do is talk about how did we get here? You know, how did America get to be 310 million in population? And so, just real quickly, you know, Jamestown was founded around 1640, uh, and, well, 1607, excuse me. By 1640, it was documented that there were 26,000 Europeans on the shores. By 1740, there was 1 million. By 1800, about 4 million. Uh, when the Louisiana Purchase occurred in, in 1804, there were close to 5 million. So America was growing rapidly even back then. Uh, even through the Civil War, America grew about 440,000 in population a year. 1891, the U.S. started the Immigration and Naturalization Service, and by 1892, we had 70 million people. 1892, from the Jamestown to, uh, to 1892, just to the dawn of the 1900s. Uh, 1900, we were growing by a million a year. Now we're at 310, as I mentioned, and, and growing even more every day. 
And all of this growth, growth, as I said earlier, has had a tremendous pressure on our natural lands, our wetlands, our coastal areas, uh, mountains and the plains. Uh, you know, we've plowed up our shores, we've experienced dust bowls through the year, and years and other catastrophic uh, weather events and other events that have affected our lands. And at present, guess what? We have about 3 million miles of paved roads in our country. Uh, another 1.4 million of unpaved roads, so well over 4 million roads that we have, 4.5 million. Uh, 62 million vehicles that we have running around this country now. Uh, we have 726 uh, cities that are over 100,000 in population, 20,000 or so municipal governments on our shores, 105 to 120 million households in our country, 80,000 planes in our skies every day. You know, when you think about all that, wow, that's just, that's a lot to soak in. That's a lot of pressure. And we need to think about how we're going to handle that pressure going forward, how we're going to grow. Uh, at this juncture, boy, oh boy, don't we need to be really emphasizing and incentivizing alternative energies. Uh, wind, solar is always talked about. Here in the southeast, biomass is, is a very important part of what we can offer here. We have 22 million acres of forests, and, and believe it or not, uh, our markets have dwindled for forest products. So, you know, we can take some of those, especially the slash from forest operations now, and use that to make electricity, use it to make liquid fuels. There's a lot of wonderful technologies that are right on the verge. Uh, and we need to push them. We need to push, push them on so that we can get into this next phase of how we energize. Another thing we did in the book is we looked at really great models of smart growth. One of the best models, curious to know if anybody in here has ever been to Serenby outside of Atlanta. Anybody ever seen this? This, this woman has. It's a remarkable place. Quick story about it. A guy named Steve Nigren. And by the way, this is only 35 miles, was it, southwest of, uh, of Atlanta. Steve Nigren, uh, entrepreneur, restaurateur, had the Pleasant Pheasant, and there was a whole series of Pheasant restaurants that were very successful. Those were Steve's. Well, he bought a little country place for his family to get away, I think like 20 acres or something. They would go there on the weekends, and they absolutely loved it. The more they went, the more they loved it, and uh, they bought a little more land, and he wound up with something like 80 acres, maybe 100 acres. Then one day, he and his daughter were jogging <clears throat> through this beautiful countryside, and there's the bulldozers. And Steve goes, oh, no, oh, no, it's coming. You know, here's Atlanta's, what I say, 5.7 million. It's coming to Steve now. And it just really worried him and, and you know, saddened him. And uh, so he said, well, look, I can't stop it. Nobody can stop it, really. But maybe I can guide it. And so he went to his community. He went to neighbors. He, he went to store owners and, and property owners, and he said, listen, guys, this is coming, and we live in such a beautiful, beautiful place. Can't we work together and try to determine how this is going to happen? So the short of it is um, he's got over a 1,000 acres now, and they have like a 70-30% uh, difference, 70% natural lands, conservation easement set aside, won't be developed, 30% development. Uh, they put most of the development in a nice, beautiful community. They, they use natural vegetation around the houses. All the houses are built with what we call earthcraft standards, so they're very well insulated, they're energy tight, energy efficient. Uh, they have an organic garden that uh, services three of the restaurants in Serenby and on the weekends has a um, farmer's market that people visit. Uh, it, it, they have miles and miles and miles of trails that you can walk and hike. They have most wonderful treehouse you can imagine that was designed by the kids in the community. They have an equestrian center. They have an inn where people can come and visit and stay. They have a five-star restaurant. Uh, it's a remarkable development. It's a great idea of how we can live. And, you know, when you have these exposures to outdoors, it helps solve a lot of our health problems. You know, we don't get outdoors enough. We don't walk enough. We don't enjoy the outdoors like we used to and I think having a community like Serenby is a great example of how we can do better. So we looked at Serenby. We looked, we looked at a place uh, called Poplar Grove in South Carolina. A good friend of mine, Vic Mills, is developing a uh, slightly different concept, but still using conservation easements. Vic 
purchased something like four to 5,000 acres of land from a big timber company and then worked with Ducks Unlimited to do a conservation easement. And with the, the money that he made from Ducks Unlimited, he was able to reduce his debt load and then therefore really build a beautiful, beautiful residential area and still preserve all these lands and come up with different, you know, some, some of it is slightly high density um, areas and some of it, uh, you have five acres, 10 acres, some even have 50 or maybe even 100 acres in this, you know, total of uh, 5,000 acres. It's a, a different approach, but a really smart and good approach. So Poplar Grove, many of you are familiar with Peace Tree City, quite a good uh, uh, development. Glenwood Park uh, in Atlanta, <clears throat> which was developed by Charles Brewer, the founder of Mindspring. We looked at Daybreak, which is an amazing reclamation of uh, mining lands in, uh, in Utah, Salt Lake City area. Uh, Cordillera Ranch in San Antonio is another one. So we, we took all these models and put them in the book to say, look, this is how we can do it. There are models that we can follow that are, are really smart and uh, and that we can copy. And as I mentioned earlier, we get to energy use and design, community design, transportation, conservation easements, which is a great tool to help preserve natural lands, land trusts like the Nature Conservancy, uh, Trust for Public Land, and other organizations that are very interested in preserving certain lands that ought to be preserved. Um, we expose really interesting concepts like biomimicry. I met this woman, Janine Benyus, about three years ago at a conference. Janine uh, is really a genius at this. Biomimicry is the study of nature to find out how we can better build and design things for ourselves. One great example is uh, these certain termites in Africa build these mounds that are just amazing. They're like, you know, from, from the ground up to here, they, they're six, seven, eight feet tall, and in the interior remains a constant temperature at all times. It's always a very comfortable temperature, and so, uh, an architect took that concept and <clears throat> used the basic design that these termites use of this mound to build a high-rise building in Africa. And guess what? No air conditioning. It stays cool, even in Africa, in the heat of Africa. So if we are looking at nature, hey, we can learn a lot. So biomimicry, we dedicate an entire um, chapter to biomimicry. There's a wonderful concept called industrial symbiosis. Am I getting late here, honey? I'm better, I don't know. Throw, it, throw something at me now. Uh, industrial symbiosis, which is you know, taking the energy that is usually wasted from an industrial op operation and harnessing that energy to do uh, other things with it. Uh, in Klundberg, Denmark, there's a 15,000 megawatt power plant. And rather than just spew that stuff out up in the air, um, there is a surplus of heat that goes to 3,500 homes in the general vicinity, and also to a fish farm. And the fish farm uh, sells the sludge from their operation for fertilizer. Uh, the steam from the power plant operation is sold to Novo Nordisk. I'm sure you've heard of them. They're a pharmaceutical um, uh, company. And the, what's called fly ash and clinker, which are uh, you know, uh, the kind of the, the um, what's the word, you know, the, the, from the, uh, thank you, byproduct, <laughs> I got lost there, byproduct of, of an operation. The fly ash and clinker from the process is sold for road building and concrete. So, you know, rather than just put that power plant up and let it spew out pollution, give us energy, yes, but they're taking all that excess energy and, and putting it to great use, and I thought that was fascinating. Uh, quickly, Ray Anderson was someone we uh, mentioned in the book. I don't know if you know of him. He has a, a company called Interface. They're the world's largest modular flooring company in the world. He's a remark remarkable man, Ray. I've uh, met him several occasions, heard him speak. He has a couple of really great books out. One is called Mid-Course Correction, uh, and which he had this epiphany that his company was polluting, you know, using petroleum products and just polluting all over the place. And it was a huge company, it was a billion dollar company. And he, and he said, you know, I don't want that to be my legacy. And so he made uh, a, a promise to himself that he, one day his company would be a zero carbon footprint. And so he's done some remarkable things uh, of recycling these, what normally carpet that would be thrown in the trash in, in a landfill or, or burned, you know, 
emitting further pollution and recycling that. And he, you know, he's put uh, solar panels on his businesses and warehouses. He's put special uh, devices so that the lights aren't on when they don't need to be and so forth. Um, remarkable. And, you know, President Clinton said not so long ago that we will never conquer climate change until it's good business to do so. And I think that's right. I think we've got to encourage our companies to be green, find reasons monetarily, economically, for them, for them to change their ways. And, and we do that in the book. You know, we try to find example after example uh, to say, guess what, you can do this. Uh, let's see. There's, there's a lot more to tell, but I, I, I've probably gone on enough. And, you know, really what this boils down to and I talk about this a lot, what it boils down to is stewardship. It's being good stewards, just like Rosalind and I are trying to carry on that wonderful heritage of stewardship of the land that her grandparents and, and forefathers uh, started. And, you know, stewardship is not exclusive to the land. It's, it's good stewards of our communities, of our neighborhoods, of our cities, our, our, our companies, our businesses. And I like to say that, you know, being a good steward is hard work. It's not easy. I don't care what enterprise you're talking about. I'll quickly illustrate this by the story about old Farmer Jones. Now, Farmer Jones goes up to Twiggs County, Georgia, buys the worst piece of property in the county. Nobody wanted it, just a piece of trash property, cut zoos all over the place, scrub oaks and everything. Nobody wanted it, but old Farmer Jones, he saw the potential, so he buys it next to nothing, goes to work. First thing he had to do was eradicate that cut zoo. <sighs> next to impossible, but he did it. Well, then he sets his mind on those fields and he gets his scrub oaks out of the way. He plows them up, puts some organic fertilizer, plants some corn, cotton, soybeans. Man, it's coming up looking good. There was some timber on the place, but it was all stagnated like a jungle. And he sets his mind to that. And he goes out there and he thins that timber and he prunes it. Man, the next thing you know, that stuff is standing up like this, tall and pretty, wildlife coming in like crazy. And then there was an old house dilapidated on the place. He goes and he shores up the foundation, puts a new roof. Paints it up, adds a room or two, renovates it, handmade furniture, picket fence, shrubbery, vegetable garden. And so this place is transformed. And the first person to see all this is a preacher. The preacher goes to check on old Farmer Jones, can't believe his eyes. Farmer Jones, my heavens, look what you and the Lord have done. You and the Lord have put those fields back into shape. I, I, that's the tallest corn I've ever seen. That cotton is white as snow. I came by that timber that used to be like a jungle. I saw 40 deer. Busted five cubbies of quail, saw 30 wild turkeys. You and the Lord have restored this house. I can't believe it. Went on and on about the Lord and Farmer Jones. Finally, at the end of all this, old Farmer Jones wipes a sweat and says, No offense, preacher, but I think you might have seen this place when the Lord had it all to himself. <laughs> So, you know, that's what the, the book is in essence about. It's about being a good steward of our planet, and uh, hopefully it will help open some eyes and, and give some ideas and thoughts to folks uh, of ways that we can do that. So, with that, I'll entertain any questions that folks might have. Questions? What's Mick Jagger really like? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last... Uh... Last Pink Floyd record I bought had a thing that said uh, <laughs> that it was every it was made in such a way that it was carbon neutral. Yeah, is that is that a real deal or are they just? No, it is a real deal. Now look, let, let's admit it. Uh, entertainment, especially touring uh, for big bands like the Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, uh, and others, create a tremendous carbon footprint. You know, you think of the. Uh, the transportation it takes to get the band around, and then think, and, and the trucking, the equipment. Think about the, the transportation it takes to get the fans there, especially for these huge uh, concerts that we sometimes do. So, yeah, there's a tremendous carbon footprint for doing that. And artists are becoming more and more aware of this. There, we point out many in the book, uh, Jane, uh, Jack Johnson, that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, Jack has a passion for oceans. He's a surfer. And so uh, he owns a studio in LA that is solar powered. Uh, there's even a fellow up in Atlanta that we talk about in the book that has a summer concept for his studio and trying to lower the carbon footprint. On tour, uh, a lot of bands are using biodiesel in their buses uh, to help lower that carbon footprint. And where they can't eliminate it, you can actually do a carbon audit. And we did that with the Stones for 
not for the whole tour, but for the UK portion of the um, uh, the tour before Bigger Bang, which I think was, uh, we worked with an organization called Future Forests, uh, and Ed the University of Edinburgh did a car carbon audit to determine how much carbon would be admitted by the Stones tour and the fans coming for the UK portion of the tour. And then uh, we offset that by uh, working with Future Forests to plant X amount of trees in places like Scotland and Africa and other parts of the world. So, you know, offsets are a big part of this about how we can conquer some of, some of what we're, uh, you know, emitting. And, and bands are very aware of this. Uh, again, as I mentioned, there's a chapter dedicated to artists. It's Sounds Green is the name of the chapter that uh, people that are doing things. But, you know, others that are conscious, uh, Bonnie Ray, uh, uh, Don Henley has helped to save Walden Woods. Um, and there, there's quite a lot of artists that, that are very interested in this. Actors, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is, is done some wonderful things uh, in this regard. Chuck, you seem so comfortable in the pulpit. <laughs> <laughs> You're not contemplating a career change. <laughs> what did he say? Comfortable? You're not contemplating a career change. A career change. <laughs> well, you know, Lanny, uh, the rock and roll business, I don't think the Stones are going to tour this year, so I, I might need a job. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to the authority. <laughs> Questions? Over here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's a very interesting question. The question is concerning um, water usage and how, uh, you know, how we can deal with that. We're using so much water. We're using water in our, in our crops, as we know. There's so much irrigation in, in farming these days. As a matter of fact, one of the things we get into is while we all think of cotton, and I'm not against cotton, you know, I love cotton, but uh, cotton is one of the uh, highest requ requirements of water usage of any crop out there. And so we're, you know, it's something to think about. You're, you're irrigating quite a lot. It's an organic product, and I love it. But it, it just gives us all something to think about. And, and it, the, the issue is really, you know, uh, you don't want to do good and, and do bad in the process of, of that. There's a lot of angles to look at, and there's no easy questions. But, uh, again, I just feel like, at this point in time, this is the juncture. Now is the time that we really start, we, we need to start dealing with this. We can't put it off any longer. You know, climate change is a real thing. I, there are still some naysayers out there, but there, in my mind, there's absolutely no doubt. Uh, you know, I think, I, I forget the year that it's predicted, I think 2030, uh, that Glacier Park will no longer have glaciers. It's gone. Uh, we've, we've all seen it on television. You know, We've all read about it in news reports and so forth. This reality is happening. Um, so isn't it really time for us to address these things? And, you know, hopefully my book does that. And by the way, you know, there's a lot of other great books out there on this subject. Uh, the Plot to Save the Planet uh, by a guy named Brian Dumaine, who's a writer for Fortune magazine. And, and you know, there's a lot of good books on the subject. But uh, if we don't try to make these changes and don't try things. You know, it's like Mick Jagger says when we're working out the set list and, and, and I'll suggest to him uh, some song and he'll kind of say, oh, I don't want to do that, you know. And then he'll I'll push him a little bit and he'll say, well, I guess you do have to change. You, you've got to try things, <laughs> you know. And you do, you have to try things. So to, don't be afraid to fail. You've heard that time and time again. We're going to fail. We're going to make some mistakes along the way. But if we don't try, we'll never get there. Take one more question. One more question? I have one. Good. Being in the forestry business, do you ever hear talk uh, amongst forestry people about the reintroduction of the long leaf? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, for those of you that don't know, longleaf pine used to be the dominant species of tree from uh, 
uh, Virginia down to East Texas. Uh, millions and millions of acres of longleaf. And then as time went on, the European settlers came and they cleared forests for agriculture and other usages, uh, mainly for agriculture. Uh, and finally, or somewhere around the turn of the century, Theodore Roosevelt era, we began to reforest and we realized we were losing our forest. We needed to put trees back in the ground. Uh, the main reason that they didn't use longleaf was because it's a fickle tree. It's very difficult to get started. And they found that species like loblolly pine and slash pine were much easier to establish. And so uh, for decades and a century, uh, that was kind of the methodology that, to plant uh, throughout all this territory, mostly loblolly and uh, slash pine to replace the longleaf. Well, now there is a push and a lot of incentives for landowners like Rose Lane and I and me to, uh, to reintroduce longleaf. There's a lot of programs that will help site prep your land and help you put those trees in the ground, you know, pay you for doing so. Uh, longleaf is an elegant tree. There's... Uh, Who's uh, uh, what, what's the great book that, uh, about Longleaf? Uh, the woman wrote, Rosalind, help me out here. Ecology of a Cracker Childhood. Yes, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood. Uh, wonderful book that celebrates Longleaf and, and that ecosystem, that great Longleaf wiregrass ecosystem. I think it's coming back. It's, it, as I said, it's a slower growing tree. It's very difficult to get established, and that's, that's the challenge, really. And by the way, it doesn't always grow in areas where loblolly will. Loblolly comes from a uh, Native American word that means grows in water. And longleaf does not do well in low areas. So uh, it does very well in sandy hillsides and certain other uh, sites. So I think you're gonna see that coming more and more. And, and speaking of which, uh, by the way, there's a lot of wonderful things being done in nurseries these days. Nurseries that are growing pine that'll eventually make forests. Uh, not only genetic improvements, there is that, but uh, there's also uh, pollination technology where they're collecting the pollen only from the very, very best and strongest trees and then using those to grow the nurseries and then using that to reforest. So going forward, you know, those are some of the good things that are happening. Uh, we can grow our forest stronger and faster uh, with these technologies and they are very important to us. Is that it? Okay. Uh, is there one You're very kind. This gentleman does have a question. I'm going to allow it. Yeah. Yes, sir. I have no idea. <laughs> I got to give another quick answer to that. You know, when I had the epiphany that I wanted to be a musician, I, I was all excited. And I when I was about seven years old, went to my mother and I said, Mama, I got something really important to tell you. She said, gosh, you're all worked up, Chuck. What in the world's the matter? I said, I made a big decision. She said, well, what? I said, Mama, I've decided I want to be a musician when I grow up. And she looked down and said, honey, you can't do both. <laughs> don't have an adjustable stool here. Well, guess what? I have a song called Savannah. <laughs> and I've never played it in Savannah. <laughs> so here it goes.
Thank you. And the sponsor is Mr. and Mrs. Mason White.